Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on differential equations. This is video 37, or video 2 in the subsection on the wave functions of the hydrogen atom. Specifically, I'm going to solve the radial equation for hydrogen. So just like video 36, I have a lot of videos previous, which are relevant, and I suppose I went through those in videos, in video 36. So to add to it, I must add, of course, video 36. Now, in this video, I moved the Schrodinger equation from a partial differential equation to the product of three ordinary differential equations. So I use the method of separation of variables. And one of those ordinary differential equations was the radial equation. So what we have is capital R function of small r, and we have the radial equation here. Note that we have our separation constant capital A, which we'll see later on is the orbital angular momentum quantum number, or is related to the or orbital angular momentum quantum number. So it's L outside of L plus one. And if you wonder where that's coming from, look at video number 32, because I motivated why we use uh, A is equal to L outside of L plus one. And I won't, I won't be discussing it again here for that reason. Now the potential term is the electrostatic potential. So it's E over four pi epsilon zero times the radius. We have a minus sign, of course. And the reason I've multiplied by this, is the, the Z term, is because we can, uh, we can account for, I suppose, more than one particle. So that should be pretty straightforward. Now, plugging it all into the uh, into the radial equation is, you know, it's pretty straightforward, but it doesn't lead to a very easy solution. So before I do that, what I'm going to do is, is a change of variables. So notice at the moment we have capital R function of small r. What I'd like to do is change it so that we have a capital R, sorry, a small u function of r instead of capital R function of small r. So u instead of capital R. So we define small u as small r multiplied by capital R. Now the operator from the radial equation which we require is d dr outside of r squared d capital R dr. So I'm not going to go through the details, they're there for you if you like, but we can rewrite the operator here. This allows us to rewrite the radial equation. So I've plugged in the separation constant a which is l outside of l plus one and i've i suppose i've plugged in our new operator we note of course that the r term remaining here or the one over r term remaining here can be rewritten as small r the radius multiplied by this new function u and all of this put together allows us to rewrite the radial equation as follows here note of course that it is simply laplace's equation something which i've put a great deal of effort into solving in the past now, I suppose for that reason you should be saying to yourself, that means it's a very simple solution, but it is a bit more difficult because of the constants. We have, for example, Planck's constant, the mass, and so on. But for, for that reason, it, it, is a bit more, it is a bit more difficult to do. So we have Laplace's equation, and we need, to, we need to solve it. So the next step is as follows. We, like I said a moment ago, we insert the potential. Now, the usual step when solving the Schrodinger equation is to make the change of variables, say k, or in this case kappa, is the minus, or excuse me, the square root of minus 2me over h, or the uh, kappa squared is equal to minus 2me over h bar squared. Notice, of course, that the units on this are per meter. So it is the it is a wave number, and that's that's what we'd be, we, we would be expecting. Also note, by the way, that the, we, because of the minus sign, we, it, it seems that we're going to have a complex kappa. But in actual fact, for bound solutions, we require the energy to be negative. And unbound solutions, of course, the energy can be positive. So for that reason, in actual fact, kappa is a real number for bound solutions, which is what we are interested in. It's also interesting to note that if we multiply kappa by the radius, we get a dimensionless quantity, kappa times r. So I'm going to use that to rewrite the, uh, the Schrodinger equation in a, a, as a function of small u. So I've rewritten it. We have our kappa here. And if you look closely, I've kind of, uh, there's a kappa squared, but I've written it as kappa outside of r times kappa. And we have an r times kappa to be squared over here. And the reason we're doing that is because we're going to make yet another change of variables. This time we're going to go from u a function of small r to u a function of rho. And we define rho as equal to kappa times the radius r. So that means we've gone from 
capital R a function of small r to small u a function of small r to small u a function of rho. And in a moment I'll explain why we do that. So using rho function, uh, excuse me, rho is equal to kappa times r, we're able to, I suppose, we have one over kappa, ti or kappa times rho, kappa times r up here, which can be rewritten as rho, and we have rho squared. That's pretty straightforward. Now, of course, we need to change the actual functions themselves, and I'm not going to go, go through the details, they're there for you. So we can rewrite them as follows. So we have the we have small u, the, taking the second derivative with respect to, to rho, is equal to small u, taking the second derivative with respect to r, multiplied by 1 over kappa squared. Now, this allows us to rewrite the Schrodinger equation yet again. So we have u, a function of rho, taking the second derivative, of course, with respect to rho, is equal to, it's equal to 1 minus rho 0 over rho plus l outside of l plus 1 over rho squared, all operating on u, a function of rho. Note that I've made another change of variables, or excuse me, another placeholder rho 0. And we'll see later on that rho 0 is very important. So this is the equation that we're going to solve now that we've done our two changes of variables. So in order to solve this, we have to, we have to be, be a bit smart because if we solve it immediately using the method of power series, we're going to have numerous, numerous zero terms and we're also going to have a three term recurrence duration, which basically is a pain in the face. So the, the trick here is to take out the, uh, the limiting behavior. So the limits are when rho goes to infinity and when rho goes to zero. And what we're going to try and do is multiply those two functions together and then try and multiply by a third function which accounts for intermediate rho values. So on the top right of your screen, we're going to discuss when rho goes to infinity. So if you look at when rho goes to infinity, you'll see, for example, that the two terms involving rho uh, on the right hand side go to zero and we're just left with one operating on the function u. So this is a pretty straightforward second order differential equation. It's got constant coefficients, which allows us to use the method of the characteristic equation. And once again, I'm not going to go through the details, but we can we have the solution that u of rho is equal to a times e to the minus rho plus b times e to the plus rho. Now we need to look at the behavior when rho goes to infinity. And we see that this term here blows up. Now, while it, it's a mathematically um, perfect solution, it's not a physically good solution because it does not allow us to normalize the equation. So on physical grounds, we say that b must be zero and we get that u a function of rho as rho goes to infinity as a constant, let's say capital A, e to the minus rho. So we now have the limiting behavior as rho goes to infinity. Now we need to look at what happens when rho goes to zero. So if we look when rho goes to zero, remember this term here had a one over rho and this term here had a one over rho to be squared. So as rho goes to zero, we have one minus a large term plus a very large term. And the very large term is L outside of L plus one divided by rho squared. And that's the one that we're going to be using. So this one is more difficult. And the reason it's more difficult is that we have, a, we have variable coefficients rather than the constant coefficients that we had the last time. This requires the method of Frobenius, a power series solution method. So to do this, you know, I've discussed it in the past. So to do it, we say that u a function of rho is equal to the infinite sum from n is equal to zero of a sub n rho to the n plus r, where r is just some, it's, it's um, another term, we just add r. Now note, by the way, we're going to be multiplying the, uh, let's see, sorry, I'm actually noticing there's a typo there, there should be u here. Notice we're going to be multiplying u by rho to the minus 2. So I've already added in in blue rho to the minus 2. We need, of course, to get the second derivative of this. And of, you can work through the step, steps yourself. So we get n is equal to sum of n is equal to 0 to infinity, a sub n, n plus r, n plus r minus 1, rho to the n plus r minus 2. Note, of course, that when we multiply u a function of rho by rho to the minus 2, it has the same exponent as the second derivative term. And it also starts at the same point, namely n is equal to zero. So this is what we require in order to use the power series method. So what I've done is I've plugged both of those back into our equation 
and I've factored out the infinite sum of a sub n rho to the n plus r minus 2. And this has to be equal to 0. Now, we can't have the infinite sum equal to 0 because we would, we would get a trivial solution and everything would be 0. So this leads us to r squared minus l squared is equal to r plus l. Now, you, you, you know, it's, we need to solve for r. So it's a small bit of a sleight of hand. And if you think about it, it can be rewritten in the following way. And that allows us to say that r is equal to either minus l or plus l plus 1. Now, just so we can look at the behavior of this when n is equal to 0, we set n is equal to 0. And we view a function of rho is equal to a times rho to the minus l plus b times rho to the l plus 1. Now, we're looking at the limiting behavior when rho is equal to 0. And if you look closely, that's, that means that the rho to the minus l term blows up because we're going to have one, we're going to have basically a 1 over 0 term. Uh, yeah, we're going to have a 1 over 0 term. So for that reason, on physical grounds, we say that the constant a must be 0. And we're left with that uh, u, when rho goes to 0, is a constant multiplied by rho to the l plus 1. So that was slightly more difficult, but yet not particularly difficult as um, power series solutions go. So what we can say now is that u a function of rho is the product of the limiting behavior when it goes to infinity, uh, rho goes to infinity, the limiting behavior when rho goes to goes to zero. Excuse me, this is when it goes to uh, this is when it goes to zero and this is when it goes to infinity. And we also multiply by another term which accounts for the behavior of the function at intermediate row values. So you might think that this is uh, you know this isn't a fair way of going to solve the equation, but I, I can assure you that in fact it is. Now just to remind us that we're solving u a function of rho, but earlier on we were solving u a function of r and capital R a function of small r. So this is all it's it's all I suppose ways of simplifying the equation and we put them all together at the end. Now, like I said, we must put um, we we, not, we we must now put this new function into the radial equation. So this new functional form of u function of rho to find out the functional form of this intermediate function v. And this is a tedious process. So if you like, you can skip this because, to be honest, it's just it really is just algebra. You can skip onwards. But if you want to see the details, well, of course, I'm going to have them here for you. So we need to get when we plug it into the uh, when we plug it into the the radial equation. So let's just go back to the radial equation. Just bear with me now. So we have this is the equation up here on the top left of your screen. So we need to get the second derivative uh, in order to be able to use our new functional form of u. So what we do is we take the first and second derivatives as follows. So we get the first derivative and we know of course that, that that's it's simply just going to be the product rule and I'll let you go through the the details there. Now note by the way and this is I suppose, this is interesting instead of having rho to the l plus 1 I've rho to the l which means I'm after multiplying in by a rho into the the other terms there. Now in order to get the second der second derivative of this I'm going to to solve it as follows. I'm going to say that a capital A is equal to rho to the l capital B is equal to e to the minus rho and c is what's left. And the second derivative is simply going to be a prime bc plus ab prime c plus abc prime. And I'm going to call each of these 1, 2 and 3 or equations 1, 2 and 3. So like I said, it is tedious. I'm not really going to work through the details other than to say that I make the substitution I call alpha rho to the l e to the minus rho. And I suppose that just, that just simplifies things a small bit. So equation 1 becomes equation 1a, equation 2 becomes equation 2a, and equation 3 becomes equation 3a. So we need to add all of the three of these together in order to get the second derivative. And we find that on the bottom of the bottom right of your screen we have the second derivative. A it's you know it's not a difficult um der derivative to calculate, but it is, I suppose, tedious nonetheless. So we now have the second derivative which we still must plug into the actual radial equation itself. So on the next page I do that and you know once once again it's it's a slow process. So what we have, just to remind us, we have that u a function of rho is equal to rho to the l plus one 
times e to the minus rho times v. And using our substitution, that means it's alpha times rho times v, where we had, where we had alpha is equal to e, rho to the l e to the minus rho. And we have our second derivative. We, excuse me, we have our radial equation here. So plugging, plugging it all together, what do we get? We get quite a lot of terms. So we get this alpha outside of all of these terms here. And then we have still terms on the right hand side. Notice by the way, I didn't really have room to write it, but we still have rho alpha v multiplied in here. Okay, and we can rearrange this very simply as rho times v double prime, two outside of l plus one minus rho, outside of v prime, and rho zero minus two l minus two outside of v. And that is, that is I suppose, our, our solution. So we're now after plugging in our new functional form of u into our radial equation. And this is what we have to solve. And this will give us the complete solution. Notice, by the way, we have, of course, we have variable coefficients. So we can't use the method of the characteristic equation. This means that we must use the method of uh, power series. Okay, now this time we don't have to use the method of Frobenius. It's, uh, this, this is slightly easier. So what we say is that u, a function of rho, this is actually a u, believe it or not, that's a u, a function of rho, is the infinite sum of j is equal to zero, c sub j, rho to the j. And I've taken the first derivative here, and I've immediately shifted indices. I, you know, you can look at my videos on how to shift indices if you like. And I've taken the second derivative also, and that also, I've, I've, sh I've shifted the index on that. Now the reason I've only shifted the index on the second derivative by one is if you look in the bottom left of your screen, we're going to be multiplying by a row anyway. Okay, so putting this all together, you'll see that uh, they'll all start at the same point, and they will all have the same uh, they will have the same exponent. All right, namely row to the j. So putting them all in, we have quite um, quite a horrible looking equation but nonetheless, it is really just algebra. So we note, of course, that when we factor out the, the infinite sum of rho to the j, that of course can't be zero because otherwise we have the trivial zero everywhere solution. That means that the sum of the coefficients must be zero, which is, is normal. And we can rewrite this as our recurrence relation c sub j plus one in terms of c sub j. This is our recurrence relation. Now notice, just looking at the recurrence relation, we notice what happens at large j. So at large j, you can look at them if you, if you like, we get basically it's two times c sub j over j plus one. Now note, you, you might be wondering, how come I've kept the plus one here where I seem to have gotten rid of lots of other small terms? It's actually just for ease. So you can you know just accept that that's what we do. So in the limit, and I'm not going to prove this, when we do this, the limit is that we get u is proportional to e to the rho, which means, of course, that it blows up because as rho goes to infinity, this blows up. So it's not a it's not a mathematical excuse me it's not a physical solution, but rather it is a mathematical solution. So at the moment, our recurrence relation here, it works, but only mathematically. It does not work physically. So the usual trick here is we get the or we get the recurrence relation to terminate as a maximum number. So we call it the maximum uh, coefficient j maximum. And if you look closely, this happens when 2j, 2j max, plus 2l, plus 2 is equal to rho 0. So we call all the all those other terms, we call j max plus l plus 1, we call that the, we call that n, another integer. And you may or may not realize that this is the principal quantum number. Or what this means is that we can have 2n is equal to rho. I'll just rewrite that. So 2n is equal to rho. And remember, rho was equal to kappa times r, and kappa allowed us to get, that was our that was our wave number, kappa, kappa was our wave number, but this allows us to get our energy. So we'll see in the next video that we're able to relate n, the quantum number, principal quantum number, to the energy. So what we've done now is we've solved the radial equation. In previous videos, I've solved the azimuthal and polar equations. And in the next video, I'm gonna put the lot together and talk about the wave functions for hydrogen. Now look, I perhaps you perhaps you might think that this video was quite tedious, but we have to also remember that hydrogen is one of the few 
elements that we can actually um, you know we can actually properly solve there it, it, for its wave function so the fact that it looks slightly uh, tedious and slightly difficult shouldn't really surprise you because we can't do anything for really for other uh, elements so thanks for watching please pass it on to your friends subscribe to my channel and you might also give me a comment in the box below